Welcome. Uh, this is going to be our second uh, video discussing Brownian motion, which is a very cool stochastic process we introduced in the last video, uh, link below in the description. Um, Brownian motion is a continuous uh, stochastic process, it exists in continuous time. Um, so kind of as before, we, we have this value x sub t, <clears throat> um, that's the random variable of the stochastic process. It's indexed at t because, again, stochastic variables are random variables that evolve through time. So here I have my, my x-axis is, is t, and I kind of just have this Brownian motion uh, sort of bouncing around. And in our last video, we talked about uh, why, it, or basically the definition of Brownian motion is that x sub t um, has a normal distribution with mean zero and variance time t. So the longer you know, you're know you projecting out, the longer you're looking out, um, the, the bigger the variance. So variance grows with time. Um, we're going to talk about a really cool, uh, um, a, a very cool uh, property of Brownian motion. It's actually a property of uh, kind of a broader class of um, stochastic processes, but we're going to apply it to Brownian motion. And that that, pro that property is reflection. Um, reflection. And this only works in symmetric uh, stochastic processes. We're going to see why in a second. And let me just see if this red will show up. Um, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, this Brownian motion that I've generated, generated um, and I'm going to reflect it about this line. Let's say that this line is negative 5. Okay. The negative looks like it belongs in the dotted line. So this line is negative 5. I'm going to reflect my Brownian motion about that line. Okay. So starting at where my Brownian motion crossed that line, I'm going to reflect it basically like, like a mirror, like, you know, looking in a mirror or staring in a pool. I'm going to reflect my process about this line. Yeah, you can't really see that. Uh, I'm trying to make it closer. Awesome. You can see that a little bit better. So you can see that I just sort of, my, my drawing isn't amazing, but um, I basically folded the, the black line, which is my original uh, Brownian motion, back over the axis of symmetry, which is negative five. Um, and I, you know, I have this, this reflected um, kind, of, kind of line. Um, so you can see the reflection. It's like looking in a mirror. Um, and the cool part about this is that this Brownian motion, the original Brownian motion, this black line, which we'll just call A, and this new Brownian motion, which is this black line, and then stops at negative 5 and, and kind of goes back up. We call that B. A and B, A and B, the Brownian motions, have the same probability of occurring. They, those paths have the same probability of occurring. Um, and they end up in different places, but they have the same probability of occurring because of symmetry, right? They're the same up until this point, so that makes sense that they have the same you know, probability until that point. After this point where they're reflected, you know, one is above negative five and one is below negative five, but because the Brownian motion has a mean of zero at every point, it's, you know, equally likely to be negative one or one, or negative 0.5 or 0.5. It's symmetric about zero. So, you know, the changes about this line are symmetric. They have equal probability. Even though one is above and one is below, they have equal probability of occurring. It's the same, you know, in a normal distribution, which the Brownian motion is, right? Um, you know, the probability of being between these two values, you know, is the same as the probability of being between these two values, right? If, if this is uh, negative A and negative B, and this is A and B, right? It's symmetric. It's symmetric about zero for a normal distribution. That's what the Brownian motion is, and that's basically a simple proof for why, for why this is the case. Um, I'm going to erase this. And you might be saying, okay, this doesn't seem like a very, like, useful... Uh, property, why would this help us, how can we ever use it? There's actually some, some cool um, ways we can kind of use this property to answer what will be challenging questions. So uh, the first way I'm going to use it is by asking what's the probability um, that the max of x Take a second to write out. Um, is 
this. Okay, big uh, kind of term that I've written out here, but let's go through and explain it. So this is saying the probability that the maximum of x sub s for s less than 100. So basically saying the maximum of the Brownian motion up to time 100. So, you know, 100 minutes, 100 seconds, the, the unit kind of is relevant, but up to time 100. Um, we want that the maximum, the Brownian motion hits 5, the maximum gets at least above 5. Um, but also, I forgot to put and... Um, and, uh, <laughs> I said, um, he was in. So the, the maximum of x sub s hits is greater than 5, and x sub 100 is less than 0. So it hits 5, goes above 5, hits 5, but ends below 0, right? What's the probability of that? You know, a couple of, you know, here's an example. Let's say this is 5. Here's an example of a process that would, you know, achieve that. It, it hit 5, went above 5, then went below 0. Um, this is an example of a process that would not achieve that. Um, let's say this is, you know, time 100. Th this process hit above 5, didn't end below 0. Um, here's a process that never hits 5 and, and ends below 0. So we kind of get the idea. You have to hit 5 and then kind of end below 0. Um, and this is kind of difficult to solve because it's like, okay, how do I think of it? Like, it could hit 5 at any time up until time 100. And it could go... You know, once it hits five, then I kind of have a sense of how I can figure out how it gets below zero. But it could hit five at any time. Do I have to do some sort of integral to figure out the probabilities of hitting at a different time? Ugh, it just seems like a total mess. Um, but what's cool, a cool trick we can use, is we can think of let's see, copy this wrong line. We can think about our Brownian motion, and we can draw this line at five. And we can actually use our reflective property and reflect our process about five. Okay? We're going to reflect our process about five. So let's draw a process kind of meandering around, and let's say it hits five. Okay? Let's reflect that process from there. So, you know, like maybe this process goes back down and finally it, you know, ends below zero, so it kind of satisfies our what we want. The reflection is going to look like this. Can you see that? Yeah, you can kind of see that. Reflection is going to like this. Um, and what's really cool is that if this, are, first of all, we know that these two Brownian motions have the same probability by the reflective property. What's really cool is if this black line ends below zero, what does that mean for the red line? It means the red line ended above 10, right? So because the black line hits five and then travels down more, five or more to get below zero, right? It hits five and travels down five or more to get below zero. The red line from five, it's going the opposite kind of direction as the black line. So instead of traveling down five or more, it travels up five or more, which means it ends above 10. It's actually way easier to calculate the probability of ending above 10 instead of calculating the probability of hitting five and then ending below zero. That's, that's way easier. So we can very simply just write probability that x uh, sub 100 is greater than 10. And that's, that's, our, that's all we need to find out. Um, instead of finding out like these two different cases, blah, 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 we can just use this reflection prob property, see that getting below 0 after hitting 5 is equivalent in probability terms to getting above um, uh, 100. Sorry, getting above 10 by time uh, 100. Um, and we know that x uh, 100 is just a normal distribution with mean 0 and uh, variance 10, right? So we just have to find, sorry, variance 100. We just have to find the probability that this normal distribution is uh, above, right, above 10. This is something, you know, you've done since AP statistics. Um, so all it is, you know, if you're not familiar with this, this is P or the uh, shorthand for the CDF cumulative distribution function of a normal distribution. We just have to find uh, of a standard normal distribution. We just have to find P of 100, sorry, 10, which is the value we want to end above, minus zero, which is the mean of the normal, all, all divided by um, 10, 
1 divided by 10, which is uh, the standard deviation of the normal. This is Plunger's variance for 100 is 10. This comes out to be of, of 1. Um, and we're doing 1 minus because we want the probability of being above centering. Minus. Um, you know, and, and that's going to be, uh, just you know this quicker off the top of my head. Thirty-two. So normal distribution. This will be a learning experience for all of us. Uh, normal distribution. We have the sixty-eight uh, within one state negative sigma and sigma. There's sixty-eight percent of the density is there. Um, that means that on either side here there is um, sixteen percent on each side. Sixteen percent on each side. Um, so we're looking for 1 minus phi of 1. Phi of 1 is uh, everything under here. We want 1 minus that. That's just the top tail over 16%. So 1.6. And sorry, I kind of butchered that like last probability calculation because I'm, I'm very rusty on it. But know that we're just taking a uh, normal distribution with mean 0, variance 100, standard deviation 1. And we're finding the probability of that going over 10. You know, you can. You can convert it here to uh, standard normal. It's just the probability of standard normal being over one. You can look up in your table, you know, your normal distribution table, see what that probability is. Use your calculator, kind of whatever. Um, but the point is, sorry, I got a little sidetracked with the normal distribution calculation. The point is, is that the probability of uh, this whole thing happening of x, you know, hitting five and then ending below a hundred, probability of that happening is very easy to find, and it's 0.16. That kind of makes sense, right? Like this is. This seems like it, it's difficult for it to happen. It shouldn't happen most of the time, right? Um, so it kind of makes sense that it happens 16% of the time. And I should also give an example because this is a pretty nice example where it hits five and then goes back down. It doesn't have to stay below five after it hits. So, you know, for example, um, we, could, we could have a process that maybe hits five, stays above five, goes below five, goes back above five, and then goes down below zero. That, that's totally fine. We, we just start reflecting once we hit five. Okay, so I'm going to take minus. We just start reflecting once we hit five, and you know the lines can cross five a bunch of times, just matters where they end. This red line is still going to end above 10, right? If red line is still going to end above 10 if the black line ends below zero from five. So uh, hope you enjoyed this. I think this is a very neat property. Uh, one thing that's really cool about probability and stochastic processes is that it allows us to do very complicated problems in a very simple way, and uh, this problem does just that. So see you next time.